Oh, setting up. Hey, Kian. Hey, hey, see, it's live on YouTube. Yeah, I, did I make it live? Looks like it. It's got. A, I've got a notification saying it's live on YouTube. So do I, yeah. I'm going to hop um, over to the page and see. Let's hop over to YouTube, and then I'll get the link, and I can post it's to my live. Twitter. I see it on YouTube as well. That's great. Okay, let me just click. Let me click on the link. So, uh, and then I, I'll, I'll put that on Twitter. Okay. Great. So, uh, you'll uh, help me figure out how to look at comments and stuff as well. Um, yeah. And keep in mind, we are live now, so it, it is working out. Um, yeah. Uh, so if anyone already is joining us, thanks for, for uh, waiting through our technical difficulties, but this is really exciting. Um, you should be able to, from the YouTube page itself, you, you'll want to open up the YouTube page in a separate window, and you, you can see all the comments rolling in there. Or I think you might need to enable the chat from your YouTube page, if you remember that dashboard. Okay, so... So go to studio yeah go to the studio page okay i'll do it as well so i can see what you're seeing okay on the channel dashboard now what? um go to the live option up at the top right yeah yeah in the studio go live yeah. Okay. okay. You click on click on the link. Mm -hmm. So live now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, made for kids. No, made not made for kids. No, not made for kids. Okay. I'm trying to to log in as well. Yes, restrict my video to viewers over eighteen. No, don't restrict my viewers. Yeah. No. Save. Okay, I see it. Um, live chat. So, do you think live chat is? I'm 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 typing something into the chat. Can you tell me if you see it? I wrote hello. Let me check. Hold on, it's not loading quite right for me. There we go. I see it. Okay, so I don't know if anyone's listening in right now. How do I? How do I find that out? Um, there should be like a. It says there's 14 watching now. If you look over it, uh, really? I'm not sure where it'd be on your screen, but there are 14 people watching now, so it's it's starting Perfect. to build up. Welcome, everyone. We're almost ready to start. Okay, <laughs> so thanks, Ken, for your help. You're welcome to leave at any time and go back to bed. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, you know, I might might sit in as a viewer for a little bit. So good luck. Uh, you know, I'm glad we got this working out, and I uh, hope everyone enjoys. Thank you. Ken. All right, bye bye. Well, Roy, here we are. Here we are indeed. The eminent social psychologist, Roy Baumeister. It is a pleasure to have you here today. You are, um, are you the most cited psychologist alive today? <laughs> I is think that uh, possible? I think Al Bandura has that honor. Uh, there was a recent uh, compilation by Ioannidis, the great statistician. And, um, he had me down as fifth or something in psychology. Not uh, bad. Sorry. It's all right. It's fifth of perhaps of all time, right? Uh, I think the uh, he did have some people in there who were dead. I, uh, who knows? But Roy, anyway. you might be the fifth most cited psychologist of all time. Anyway, I know that you don't get caught up on such things, but I I uh, just want to just uh, let our, our listeners who are commenting right now, um, I don't know, I don't think you can see the comments, so I'll, I'll read them to you as they, as they come along. Uh, people, if I want to encourage anyone who's uh, in the room to please type things in the windows and ask questions as we um, continue our conversation. So I want to start off by, uh, before we get to the free will and your views on determinism, because you had a very interesting new paper um, that you sent me uh, on, on determinism and why you almost think it's irrelevant for psychologists. I want to start off talking about consciousness before we get to the free will stuff. Is it okay if we start sure. by laying the kind of like the foundation? 
um, okay. for the whole free will discussion. First of all, how do you define con- how do you define consciousness? Like, what do you view as the parameters of of consciousness for a psychological study? Well, defining it is is one of the most difficult uh, things. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it, it, you know it, it's a property of the mind being able to have subjective experience and it's probably also useful in in, in terms of the agent of, of, of guiding behavior most theories uh, about consciousness and, and marcella pointed this out uh some years ago um distinguish kind of two levels or two kinds uh there's sort of the basic awareness of the world and that we have in common with lots of other animals. Uh, animals, you know, they do get information uh, from their environment. And so there's, there is subjective experience there. There is, uh, you know, uh, the mind feels pain and pleasure and sees things and smells things and so on. Uh, and it uses that to move around to guide its uh, emotions that origins of the uh, central nervous system and the brain of course is the center of the center nervous system so why do brains evolve is the, is the question uh, they started with moving around and and finding food and eating um, so there's that basic level and then it seems humans have another level above that that is not shared by other animals uh, which we call conscious thought uh, that's much more advanced. It enables abstract thinking, mental simulation away from the present, are able to think about future and past, uh, replay scenes or at least reconstruct them in our minds. We can imagine what people in other places are thinking. Um, we can construct logical sequences of, of arguments and, and so on. So that's the more advanced level and that's the one that's been of greater interest to, uh, uh, to me, uh, but uh, but you know they're both important, and as we know, the what philosophers and others call the hard problem of consciousness. You know, somehow the physical brain has to create this non-physical subjective experience, and how do you get there? And lots of very smart people have thought about it, and as far as I can tell, nobody's come up with a very satisfactory answer. So it's, it's one of the things that's, that's almost miraculous in the world. And yet, you know, it's quite real. Um, as, I, as I said, real simple animals even have it. I, my guess is that pain was the, the original conscious experience that you know, very simple creatures had a feeling of pain, which is a signal that you're being damaged. You know that your your tissues that make up your body are being damaged, and it's adaptive to somehow know that centrally and then move so or do something to stop the damage. So I'm guessing that was that was the first uh, conscious feeling. Uh, but uh, you consider all the the remarkable heights of, of human subjective experience to compose music, where you have to imagine sounds and uh, put them together in your mind and string them together across time. Uh, all sorts of remarkable achievements there uh, that uh, that the human mind is able to do. So I'm not sure I've quite given you a definition, uh, but defining what consciousness is is uh, almost as hard as the hard problem. Yeah, or almost as hard as defining the self. What, what is the self? Yeah, well, I just finished a book on that, which will be out uh, toward the end of this year. And uh, uh, I said at the beginning, it's it's traditional to define your terms at the beginning, but I pushed the explanation of what exactly it is to the very last chapter uh, because it, uh, it you know it's it's a term that we use every day, self. You know, and uh, you know, I'm getting this for myself. You know, we everybody says it a lot, uh, and yet when you press them to say exactly what do you mean by that. Uh, it's it, it's remarkably difficult to uh, come up with a definition. But do you think there there it's it's valuable to say there is such a there is something we call the self that is psychologically valid? Well, there certainly is. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people question it, and I want to ask them, okay, try to next time you want to take an airplane flight, uh, try to go there without a reservation, without any identification, and explain to them that selves are illusions, and see how far you get. Uh, so uh, it's a useful fiction. 
it's uh, I don't see why you would call it a fiction. Um, well, the Buddhists have been saying that for many years that this, you know, the illusion of self. Yeah, but you know those remarkable studies by Strominger and uh, and colleagues, where uh, you know they surveyed the, the the Buddhists who supposedly don't believe in in, in the reality of the self, uh, and yet. Uh, they had higher fear of death than others. They were, in a sense, more selfish. And they asked them if you had a disease and uh, there's only one, one dose, would you take it yourself or give it to someone else, even if how it only pro prolongs your life by one day, but pro prolongs somebody else's life by several years? Uh, and the Buddhists were less likely to do it. They, noticed, they noted, too, that uh, Buddhists write lots of autobiographies. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, how can you write an autobiography if there's no such thing as a self? You know, I think what they mean uh, is, is, is something quite, quite different when the, 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 there's no self. But, uh, you know, they don't put their shoes on other people's feet by mistake because they can't tell the difference between me and you. Well, they, mean, they also mean there's no physical instantiation of the self, right? There's no, it doesn't exist in a it's a psychological concept, right? It's, it's like, it's us reflecting ourselves back on ourselves. Like, a, like we're staring at a mirror, right? Self-reflection, self-concept. Um, self-concept, well, is a concept of something, which is yeah. the self. Uh, it's so I say in the book, a map of France is not the same thing as France itself. Right. Uh, people have self-concepts. They are partly right and usually somewhat distorted, so they're not fully accurate uh, in terms of objective facts, and yet uh, they are serviceable enough. So if you're wanting to say partly fiction, partly illusion, partly mistaken, the self-concept is certainly guilty of that. But uh, uh, the, uh, the agent inside that experiences the world and acts on that basis, takes care of itself, forms relationships. Oh, those are very real psychological processes without which we wouldn't be here. Subjectively. Objectively. We wouldn't. Objectively. Well, you know, it's, inter it's interesting because I mean, some people would, would certainly disagree. They would say that it's all, it's all an illusion, you know, that um, our subjective feeling of that we that we there is something that that is is the self is an illusion. They would say that our subjective feeling of free will is an illusion. But you, I think you're you're arguing that it's not an illusion. Depends what you mean by illusion. I mean um, certainly there can be some mistakes and errors in there. Uh, so it's I mean I read Hood's uh, the self illusion. Uh, oh, and I. And I don't think he really tried that hard to make a case that the self is an illusion. Well, he backed off and said, well, maybe it's not exactly what it seems. Okay, well, I'm, I'm fine with that. The, the idea that people have mistaken notions about themselves, let's say they overestimate their good qualities and so on, uh, that's been well documented for many decades. And, you know, and that you're, you're on safe grounds. But to say you don't have a self, well, why don't you sign your bank account over to me? Because I have a self and I could use the money. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. But are you saying, no, I know you're serious. I know, that's why. Um, but can't one get in states of consciousness where you don't identify with a self in any way? You just observe whatever experience arises and you do it without putting labels on it or you do it without a frame of reference. Isn't that what meditation practices try to get us to be? Maybe they do, but uh, you know, Gebauer's research and so on that uh, the longer people practice meditation, the more they think they're better at meditation than other meditators, the more central it becomes to their self-concept. So again, there's not much sign of vanishing uh, sense of self. Another thing I said in the, in the, in the book that's coming out is uh, you can take these people who say the self is an illusion. Imagine if, if they caught you in bed with their romantic partner, 
you know, that would be a good time for you to say, well, selves are illusions. And, you know, so it's just somebody having sex with somebody else. Uh, do you think they would say, oh, yeah, good point. I don't mind. Um, anybody can have sex with anybody. There, there are no selves. That's all fiction and illusion. I mean, good luck with that. Um, I love the way you think, Roy Balmois. I love <laughs> the way you think. I can't wait to read this book now. I think it's going to challenge a lot. Uh, when, when does it come out? It's it's just in production. Um, I don't know. Uh, Tilford started it uh, um, late uh, late January. I think the uh, the copy editor uh, has it there. So. Uh, um, oh wow! Next year. I'm guessing later this year. No, it's. Uh, oh, later this year. It doesn't take. Gotcha. You know, you publish books. You know, once they go into production, what is anywhere from six to to ten months usually till they come out. said late January. Sorry. Gotcha. But, Late January, yes, of this year, uh, the copy editor got it. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Uh, so depending on how fast yeah. she works, yeah. uh, um, she should have it back to me in the summer. Yeah, good. I look forward to reading it. Yeah, you challenge a lot of things in your in your career and your research. A lot of things that a lot of people take for granted. You know, one thing that a lot of people take for granted is that well, yeah, of course, there's determinism. You know, from a free will perspective, but um, you know, compatibilists try to figure out, yeah, of course th there is, uh, but yet what can we still salvage that might be a concept of what everyday people consider free will. But I thought it was really interesting reading your new paper. You said, well, yes, of course, everything is caused, but that's not the same thing as deterministic. And I thought that was a really brilliant distinction you made there between um, recognizing that, of course, everything has a cause, but also leaving a probabilistic, uh, underst still having a probabilistic understanding of, of your life and the future. And you, you say things in your paper that are, that are so classic Roy Baumeister. They're like, they're funny. Uh, like, you know, yeah, you know, well, Mark's demon, right? Of course we can um, have an understanding of all the uh, atoms, you know, let's say, but let's say you have that information. How would it still be able to let you predict who's going to win the Super Bowl? Like, how does that information itself still allow you to predict the, the messiness of, of human behavior? And so I thought you could just elaborate a little bit some of this argument and, and where your, your current thinking of this is on Lamarck's demon and causality. All right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Laplace's demon. Lamarck. Oh, sorry. Laplace's. Apologies. Uh, there are many. <laughs> Great thinkers there. Um, so, yeah, and for listeners who haven't heard this, Laplace articulated determinism perhaps best than any anyone else. This was a, the early 1800s, and he said, "A super smart mind, if you knew every particle in the universe where it was, and you knew all the laws of nature, uh, then you could predict exactly the future with 100% accuracy." Uh, and and so, you know, no human mind could do this. And in fact, now there are mathematical models that uh, you need a calculating machine that would exceed the size of, size of the universe to do this. So it actually could not be done. I also, I think, point out that relativity theory says, well, there's no simultaneous mo moment in the entire universe. So you couldn't do that uh, experiment uh, mm -hmm. anyway. Nevertheless, I think the more relevant point, what I was trying to make in, 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 that, in that, that paper is that for psychology, the idea that the future is inevitable, that, you know, that um, there's only one possible outcome for every situation. Uh, and so the future is determined, in, in, hence the word, uh, and that uh, there aren't multiple possibilities. That this is very counterproductive because most of what we deal with in psychology is how agents, whether they're rats in a maze going left or right, or you know humans encountering a, a complex situation of trying to choose how to find a, uh, a spouse or how to invest for saving for a house or uh, dealing with uh, future retirement or all these things, um, that we deal with situations that are defined by multiple possibilities. And you know, threat and uh, danger and opportunity and affordance, success and failure. We talk about that all the time, but those are only meaningful if uh, if they're both possible, right? I mean, during the during the self-esteem movement, my family had sort of a running joke that when we had hamburgers for dinner, we'd say, 
well, another hamburger successfully eaten. Um, you know, like it was a big success, like there was an opportunity to fail. But you know, it, you know, the joke is, how can you fail at eating a hamburger? Um, so, uh, but you know, real success and failure is something that people grapple with every time, every, every day. Uh, I talk about games. Um, the definition of a game is that there are at least two possible outcomes that either side can win. And that's not just a quirk of the game. Everything everybody does in the whole game is based on that assumption that mm -hmm. you can win and you can lose. The, the, I call it the reality of mere possibility. That's what we need to base our psychology on, not some quaint notion of deterministic inevitability. You know, when we come up, you know, and I noticed nobody explains their phenomena, their findings in, in the research literature as if you know, this was the only thing that could happen. Uh, they always talk about, you know, the threat activates this response and um, people perceive this could happen or that could happen. Um, so, uh, and then this brings us to one of the topics for today. I know you want to get onto consciousness first, but uh, in terms of free will, one of the basic definitions is the ability to act differently in the same situation. And that is pretty basic uh, to, uh, to psychology. You know, my thought even is that uh, this capacity evolved to deal with situations where there are more than one possible outcomes. Uh, indeed, more basic agency in animals um, is for that purpose. If, if the original purpose of the brain was to coordinate moving the body around to find food, well, it could go left or right. Uh, somehow it has to get the information from the senses brought by the central nervous system to the brain, which then says, well, let's go this way rather than that way uh, and look for, uh, look for something to eat. Um, so human choice is vastly more complex, uh, but uh, you know, it's building on that, that same foundation. Have you read Daniel Dennett's book, uh, Freedom Evolves? Yeah, I read it um, uh, some time ago. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult book. Um, I had just completed my manuscript for the cultural animal, which I argued that, yes, it, it evolved. Uh, no, his argument is much more philosophically sophisticated. Uh, that book for me was a, a psychological thing, but... Um, but the argument, you know, clearly, insofar as what we call free will is a capacity of the human mind, uh, it's something that evolution installed. It's, it's not something magical. It's not something outside of uh, causality. Uh, yeah. it's, it's adaptive. And one of the themes of that book, The Cultural Animal, was that pretty much all the traits that make us human, that set us apart from other animals, um, are essentially the result of adaptations to make culture possible. Culture is our biological strategy. It's how we solve the problems of survival and reproduction. And we're solving them really well. I mean, our population goes up pretty, a couple of the bugs are doing well also, but, but basically compared to all the other mammals, uh, they're seeing their populations decline. Ours is going up. Culture has been very successful to us. Culture is shared information systems uh, cooperation, um, um, you know, so culture is another one of those difficult to define yeah. terms. Uh, but uh, if you look at, say, the social systems that apes have and you know other primates, ours are way more advanced, and that's why our population is doing so much better. We live longer and better, and uh, more people live, and, and so on. Um, and it's and and so. These traits are adaptations to make that possible. Uh, in, in terms of consciousness and free will, I know the theorizing is dominated by the, the cognitive people and the, the brain researchers and the artificial intelligence. And they all tend to think, as most psychologists do, one, one mind at a time. I think like we're, with the AI, you're building a robot. And so then why would you add consciousness? What else what would you gain by adding consciousness? But you have to look at the group and the self is another one of these things. The human self took shape in order to take advantage of these better groups. Uh, like, well, look at the economy. 
uh, economic systems have brought vast improvements in, in quantity and quality of life everywhere. I mean, trade is way older than, than, than farming, as Matt Ridley said in his recent book, uh, like by an order of magnitude, uh, 100,000 years as trade goes back that far. Well, trade is a way for two people to interact that they're both better off, right? The buyer wants to buy, the seller wants to sell. And so if they can make a deal at a, at a, at a price that suits them both, then they're both better off. But no other animals have anything that's, that's an economic system. They, you know, they don't have money. They don't even have barter or negotiation or anything like that. This economic system has hugely enriched our lives, but it takes a self. It takes the ability to conceptualize different possibilities uh, and so on. So uh, again, my point is these are adaptations in the human mind, you know, refinements, say, of the our common ancestor with the chimpanzees uh, evolved a certain way so we could take advantage of these systems and live longer and better. I love uh, that. Consciousness and free will and the self, all these <coughs> are things uh, shaped by that and by the requirements uh, of effective groups. Morality is another one. Um, uh oh, morality. <laughs> Moral, moral systems that. are better. Uh, again, we incorporate moral principles into how our action is caused. Uh, so I think free will has strong roots uh, in morality. Uh, even in the legal system, you know, they ask, did you enter this agreement of your own free will or were you coerced? Um, but you know, it means that you're able to ponder the options and understand them both and understand the, uh, the consequences. And so uh, you enter into that and in incorporating and laws and morals often enforce the same kinds of behaviors, which is why I, I, I bring them up. Um, but the, the ability, if, if people in a group act morally, uh, then uh, they're all better off. You know, individually, sometimes it's an advantage to do immoral things, but often that's a short-term gain at long-term cost because, uh, especially in small groups, you get a reputation as being immoral, and then people won't cooperate with you anymore, and then and then you starve. Uh, you know, to me, you know, cooperation. John Haidt in his his book said humans are the world champions uh, at uh, cooperation. We cooperate way better than other species. Uh, in working together for common goods, but that requires trust and requires not uh, not betraying the other and not taking advantage of the other. Uh, as uh, Tomasello, another one of my favorite thinkers, he says, chimpanzees will have a group hunt, but they're all out for themselves. Um, and so whoever gets the prey will try to gobble as much of it down before the others come along and try to grab a piece or, or wheedle a piece out of them. But there's no sense of, of sharing it. But humans became much more effective hunters by doing things like one, one group will make a lot of noise to chase the prey into the, the arms of the others. But it wouldn't work for the chimpanzees because no one would want to be the noisemaker. Everyone would want to be uh, the catcher. But we share. Now, what's the crucial point is when you catch the prey, do you gobble as much as you can, like any sensible chimpanzee would do? Or do you say, no, wait, we'll divide it when everybody's here. The humans made that leap, but you had to be able to project in the future and say, well, I'm hungry, I could eat it all now, but then nobody's gonna cooperate with me and trust me tomorrow. And since I'm in a species that lives by cooperation, I'll be, I'll be in big trouble. So you project into the future and then back to guide the present and say, even though I'm hungry and I'd like to eat this juicy morsel right now, I should follow the rules, make others trust me. I mean, one of the great questions is why should people follow moral rules? Well, they're a blueprint for how to act so that others will trust you and cooperate with you, which is crucial to survival among humans. Chimpanzees mostly take care of themselves uh, individually. Um, and, uh, and yet we've moved beyond that. Again, that's one of the innovations of culture that sets us apart uh, as humans, but it takes these advanced uh, mental capabilities and uh, advanced ways of controlling action. For me, that, that's the, be one of the central points of a scientific theory uh, of, of, of free will. Well, there was a lot there. <laughs> so um, yeah, a lot there. 
uh, you need with the morality issue. Um, a lot of people, in the, the people are chatting and asking questions as you're talking. And uh, something that, that's a common theme among the, the questions is this idea of moral relativism and versus moral absolutism. You know, do you believe in, uh, in, in what Stephen Pinker kind of calls the, the moral um, uh, gr universal grammar? You know, do you believe we, we have such a thing evolved, a, a universal grammar of morality? My view, again, we adapted to take advantage of these systems. And moral rules are mostly a result of what enables a system to function better. I've been meaning to write an article, I'm not sure exactly how to frame it and how to, where to publish it and so on, but making the point that morality was discovered, religion was invented. I saw you wrote that somewhere. Uh, I've, I've used the line a couple of times. Uh, and, and I don't mean to disrespect religion. If there's one true religion, you can exempt that, but all the other religions this applies to, because the religions contradict each other. You know, it says, well, the, the, we think this is the right God and, and so on. And they think, no, that's a, a different God. Uh, whereas moral rules are very similar everywhere. Um, if you were to, uh, you know, imagine going to a culture and saying, our morals start with the 10 commandments and they would look at them and say, oh, that's funny. We have exactly the opposite. We believe it's your moral duty to lie and to kill and steal other people's property and have sex with their wives and, and all that. No, that doesn't happen because social systems really do function better when people respect each other's property, uh, respect each other's uh, relationships, don't kill each other. And uh, indeed the, the monopoly on violence is one of the definitions of the state. Uh, that uh, you know, it should be the, the government or the state alone uh, that has the right to uh, decide life and death. That people can't take that into their uh, their own uh, decisions to uh, cause other people to die. Um, those are just better social systems. If if there ever was a society that believed in the opposite of uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, it didn't last very long. So, uh, so to me, that's where I think. Uh, that uh, moral rules come from uh, and uh, how much that's built into the mind. Um, you know, the, the universal grammar question, I, I know people argue both sides of that and I, I don't have a firm grasp of, of what's right there. I mean, there are several different basic, uh, I think Pinker said there are a number of possible grammatical uh, structures in terms of uh, how sentences should be organized, but most languages use just just one or uh, of two of them. Uh, yeah. For example, does the adjective go before the noun or after the noun? In French and Spanish, you say the noun and the adjective is after it. Uh, so they they call it, you know, our, our country. The I can't pronounce French, but it's the Etats Unis. It's the States United, whereas we say the United States. Um, right. But you know, putting the adjective off in another part of the sentence doesn't work. It's always adjacent to the noun, either before it or after it. Um, in terms of then, of the morality, I think, you know, we have a, a sense of, of wanting to cooperate with others and wanting others to like us. And that may be the innate basis. And then we learn the moral rules because the, uh, the social system has them because it's learned that uh, these are the best rules for a, uh, a system to survive. I love that. Um, but it does beg the question, why do psychopaths, uh, why is it still in our gene pool? I mean, isn't that the obvious question here? Oh, I don't know that that's an obvious one, but it's a it, it's a good one. Is it a good one? Is it a good one at least? Okay. Yes, it's a very good one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I looked into that a while ago. I, I don't have a strong answer. Um, I know in uh, this is a lot of stuff I haven't read. I think it was Hare who wrote one of the the classic books without conscience, wasn't that yes. on psychopaths? Yep. Yep. And as I recall, there he said. You know, some people said there must be some adaptive advantage to being a, a, a psychopath, uh, but he, he cited some studies where, uh, um, like if they were on a bomb squad or something, uh, they ended up acting impulsively and got everyone killed. But that's not how we evolved. I think, you know, the bomb squad 
I, I recall Bob Hogan studied the personalities of people who go on those and the, the people who are attracted to bomb squad work are thrill seekers and, and danger, danger junkies. Whereas the people who are successful more have the mentality of an accountant that you follow step by step and be very careful with, with, with everything you do. You know, we evolved, uh, the men at least, uh, had to fight in groups against other men to, to get food for their women and children or to keep other groups from stealing their food, uh, again, to uh, provide for their, their women and children. And so uh, heading into battle with spears is kind of a, a dicey uh, uh, enterprise and uh, um, having someone who's impulsive and perhaps uh, not restrained by empathy or other such concerns uh, you know, might have been adaptive in, in that environment. The other yeah. thing you could say is that it, it sort of continue, it remains in the gene pool because um, it can bring advantages as long as it doesn't get too uh, extreme. Uh, it fosters a kind of selfishness. Uh, so you basically exploit everyone else's morality uh, to uh, extract resources from them and take advantage of them. Um, so it's risky. If, if you get caught, it, it, it may flourish more in the modern world because we have a lot more stranger interactions. In a small group, uh, a psychopath uh, would soon be found out and, and like I said once you betray other people or cheat them uh, they're not going to cooperate with you anymore in, in a small group which is how humankind lived in you know 90 percent or more of our history and certainly under the evolution conditions on which we evolved uh, in a small group you would quickly run out of partners uh, in fact you'd run out extra fast because you don't have to betray every one of them uh, because of language and gossip, uh, the others will tell each other's about you. So if, if you screw over a couple people- I know, people, I've been there, I've been there. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, then, you know, so reputation, I mean, that's another theme in my, my book on the self is that, um, you know, which of the concepts of self are most important? It's the desired reputation. Uh, you know, what you actually think of yourself can fluctuate around and, you know, people sort of actually have, I think, several different. They have a, a very positive version of self, which they use for job interviews and first dates and things. And they have a humble one for when they're hanging out with their friends, uh, teasing each other and whatnot. Um, the realistic one might be hard to hit, but how you want other people to know you, that is, that is crucial. That takes precedence uh, over others. And it's because your reputation is the key to your success in life. It's what others think of you. Again, under the conditions we evolved, uh, what you think of yourself, eh, you know, helps a little bit. But whether other people respect you, trust you, admire you, like you, love you, that was that was the by far the most important thing. So, again, the self is designed to build and sustain this. Morality is a big part of it. Competence is another. Uh, bravery, heroism, uh, and so on. So. For the psychopath, you know, is playing a very dangerous game in a small group because you'll run out of partners, and, and as soon as people find out that you're that you're, you're cheating them and you can't be trusted, and they tell each other about you, uh, you'll find yourself in in deep trouble. You you bring up a lot of really good points, and uh, just mapping it onto modern day social media, reputation, and the social animals that we are is playing itself out in terms of what people are calling cancel culture, you know, what people are calling, you know, reputational effects of if you say one stupid thing, you know, you're done, you know, like it, your reputation can be so tarnished, people will tarnish you on social media for it. I right. mean, you I must know. be astounded by the social dynamics as a social, as an eminent social psychologist. Do you ever watch uh, these social dynamics play out on social media with, uh, you know, with a psychological lens, like, wow, this is fascinating. I don't really spend much time on social media. Smart. I, uh, Smart. <laughs> um, you know, I sort of got my way of doing things before that. And I see it's a big stressor for a lot of people and a big uh, uh, absorber of time and energy. Uh, and what the benefits of it are, are, are a bit elusive to me. Uh, but yes, it is, it is dangerous. And uh, 
I'm, I'm the sort of person I like to try out ideas and toss things out and, and so on. And I realize, as you say, with uh, the, this culture, uh, say the wrong thing once or whatever, you can be, uh, you can be ruined and uh, discredited. So it, it's, it's just too dangerous. It, it's too bad because it's, it's canceling one intellectual style of trying out ideas and let's consider this and what if we look at it from the other side. Um, and that's the way over the years I've trained myself to think. Um, it's another reason that I can't do Twitter because there's what 140 word limit or something. And I always want to consider each issue from every side and look at it. it. It's very suitable for people who absolutely know what is right and can say it succinctly and, you know, more power to them. Uh, but that's, that's not how my mind works. Hey, fair enough. And like I said, it's probably, probably wise. You, know, you don't need it. You don't need to get caught up in in in, in that in all that muck. Um, you know, is do you think now would be a good time for me to ask you some questions? People are asking. Sure. Are you okay with that? Okay. Um, Roy, is love the antidote to suffering? Doctor Deb Lind Linda wrote, asked that question. Is love the antidote to suffering? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly what the questioner means. Uh, we have medical antidotes to suffering and love is not usually the top, you know, the first intervention. There, there, there are others. Uh, on the other hand, uh, love is a very positive force in the world. Um, some kinds of suffering, uh, like loneliness and meaninglessness and so on, are really helped and possibly cured <laughs> uh, by by love. So uh, it it's a it's a great antidote to uh, to some kinds of suffering. I don't think we could make a general case that it's going to cure cancer or uh, uh, or even set a broken leg. Um, and you know, suffering has always been with us and probably always will, although it's, you know, we complain a lot, but uh, suffering in modern life is much less than it has been in the past. I, I'd like to quote, I think it was Ben Franklin who said, if we could only uh, solve the problem of the toothache, everyone would be happy forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you imagine what it was like to have a toothache. Uh, you know, and, and most adults, most of their teeth were gone. Uh, and each tooth, you know, would be would have pain for weeks at a time that you couldn't do anything about. So, yeah, that sounds awful when you realize. So what they just is. pulled it out. Well, maybe they did that, and uh, um, you know that was painful too. But it, it's at mm -hmm. least then it got over uh, after a while. Um, it reminded the, the point that in the American Civil War, uh, you know, they were drafting lots of guys, but they had to turn large numbers away because. You had to have at least six teeth in your head that faced each other uh, so they could uh, bite off. I think with the, they were still using muskets at the beginning of the war, right? And you had, I, I don't know exactly how to do it, but you had to bite something off if you didn't have. Anyway, the, the point is, all these young men, these were young men uh, ready to go into the army and they didn't have six teeth left in their head. Um, so anyway, uh, love is not the antidote to that kind of suffering. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. again, not to disrespect, it's great, great power to, uh, uh, to bring joy. I, mean, I, I think love more on the, the positive psychology side of uh, taking you from zero into the plus than, than reducing the negative. Uh, but yeah, it's have some power for that. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If I get a headache, though, it does feel like if I just don't have the headache, I'll be happy forevermore. It's just amazing when we're in a certain state of mind of suffering, we can just generalize that and think, you know, wow, I'll just be blissful, you know, but we adapt so fast. We adapt to whatever it is, you know. Uh, yes. We, yes. Okay. Uh, so that wasn't a question. That was just a commentary. <laughs> okay. So uh, Raleigh Coley, let's see. Is So is it advantageous to be moral in small groups but when we live in a global community, it is counterproductive? That's what Ravi asked. 
Okay, well, this is a great point. Um, the utility of morality is certainly diminished in a, in a global community. Uh, although the stuff you're also bringing up that if you get caught doing something immoral and it goes viral and, you know, it's, it's, it's broadcast online, it can really haunt your life uh, for, for a long time. Now, if you're stuck in a small group, it's the same thing, you're living in a small town. Um, one of the books that I, I liked was uh, Friedman's uh, Brief History of Law in America. He made the point that, that laws and morals kind of include the same, uh, kind of encourage the same kinds of behavior, uh, but there's just an ongoing shift throughout time away from morals, emphasizing more laws. Um, and that's because of more stranger interactions. And I think that's what the questioner is bringing up. Um, in a small group, if, say, go back to the hunter gatherers or even uh, you know, a small town where you were essentially spending your whole life there uh, in, in bygone centuries. Um, uh, the moral thing was important. And if you got a bad reputation for dishonesty, uh, it was gonna really compromise your, uh, your future. And people used to talk when I was a little boy about, you know, you used to be able to shake hands on a deal and that was it. And, you know, now people laugh at that. Uh, handshake deal is worth nothing. Um, but, uh, but in a small group, the importance of reputation is so potent that it will keep people in line. But in a big city, you could go making handshake deals and then screwing over the people who make them, take their deposit and run away. And it'd be a long time before they catch up to you. And that's why laws have to step in, law enforcement, uh, to promote the same basic honest behavior uh, that moral reputation did, but you can't you can't go by reputation in a, you know in a, a big city with a, a lot of stranger interactions. Uh, indeed, one of the definitions of a city is a place where you meet strangers. Um, so uh, I think there's a shift there. Um, counterproductive, well, no. Um, although it you know, moral is costly, you know, to not do what is in your immediate best interest, not to take advantage of other people, uh, for example. Okay, you could say in a sense that's costly, uh, but it's also better to live in a society where you can trust people, where they, uh, where they do behave morally, or at least where they very well behave, obey the laws. Uh, so I think even in the global economy, morality is better overall. And it's probably better for the individual, although recognizing again, that a lot of you know, the, the point of a lot of moral rules is to not do what you feel like or what would give you an immediate advantage, rather do what is best for the group. And as Kant said, if, you know, your moral decision is to do what, if everybody acted this way, the world would be a better place. Mm. Um, so, uh, again, morality is derived from what enables a system really to flourish. So there, <laughs> no, gotcha. Um, thank you. Um, these comments are coming in really fast. And I'm trying to stay on top of it all. <laughs> um, uh, so, how often do policy makers listen to and understand psychology research? Surrealist idealist um, asked that question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I had some experts talk of, about this when I was in graduate school and the short answer was never. Um, and it's probably too, too short, but really not very much. Um, some said that if psychologists want to influence policy they need to make friends with economists because policymakers do at least listen to economists, but they don't listen much to uh, uh, other social scientists yeah. uh, at all. So you psychologists yeah. and economists uh, do sometimes make friends and work together. But, uh, you know, the president has a council of economic advisors, right? But there's no council of psychological advisors. Uh, so, you know, every so often indirectly some probably some degraded version of psychological wisdom uh, gets uh, uh, passed on and, and influences policy in some way. Uh, but uh, 
going into psychology research is is not the career path to choose if you want to influence public policy. Well, Colby wants to know, and this is a nice segue into Colby's question. Could you give a description of what a social psychologist researcher does day to day? I might want to pursue that career pathway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, social psychology is undergoing some changes uh, right now and uh, given COVID, um, what we've done and what I did most of my career is not happening hardly anywhere. Um, but for decades, uh, well, let me put it this way, uh, research psychologists, when they split off from the Freudian psychoanalysis approach, um, spent decades studying rats and they would, in the laboratory, uh, would look for basic principles of rats behavior because it was highly objective. And then he finally said, well, we're not gonna learn enough about the stuff we care about from rats. We need to study people. Uh, so some of the early studies were uh, how do, you know, when do people change their attitudes? Um, so they would have subjects, uh, you know, research participants come into the lab and they would play them one message or another message and then have them uh, rate their attitude and see who convinced them more. Um, there's uh, research on aggression got started early. Uh, so in the laboratory, two people would be working together or discussing something. And then the researchers would, you know, often would secretly have one of them um, working with the, uh, the, the experimenter and, you know, would deliver an insult or would deliver praise or uh, would, you know, would you know, manipulate something there. And then they would see how aggressively uh, the person responded, say, by delivering electric shocks or blasts of aversive noise or taking away uh, the person's rewards that they were going to uh, uh, learn. Um, some people thought the aggression was a downer, and so they started studying helping instead, you know, what makes people more generous. Um, um, the, uh, this continues in the behavioral economics is a close cousin to uh, social psychology uh, and they have a lot of these dilemmas too uh, like there's you and somebody else work on a task and then I as the experimenter come to you and say okay you guys you earn ten dollars and you Scott you get to divide it uh, between you and the other person uh, and just do whatever you think is appropriate and you can keep it all or you can give uh, half to the other or, or anything else and so they see what other factors in the situation determine how, how helpful you are, how generous you are, how selfish you are. Um, so uh, the laboratory studies uh, were really the, the rage for a while. Um, also forming impressions of people is a big thing. People might meet someone who acts in a certain way or they might watch a movie and form an impression of the person there and do you think uh, you know, this is a, a trustworthy person, an aggressive person, someone you'd like to be friends with. Um, so there's a lot. You know, right now, uh, there's been a big shift to doing online surveys, which are mostly thought experiments. And uh, I, I, I'm not so excited about this method, uh, but uh, the, the field has uh, gone through some uh, difficult self-questioning and uh, um, trying to come up with a new way uh, to study uh, social behavior, although behavior is almost uh, disappearing now. It's just, you think about this, and then how do you think about that? Uh, that's sort of become the dominant uh, paradigm for how, how we do research. Um, I, I've trained many people in social psychology, um, and uh, I've always said it's a, it's a really cool field. Uh, you can learn about people using the scientific method. Um, I'm not as positive about it now. I'm not training further researchers at the moment. I think the field is a, a rather unwelcoming and is going through some a difficult period of adjustment. I like to hope it will sort itself out uh, at some point in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, right now I'm, I'm finding it hard to uh, give as positive a view of the field and encouraging people to go into it as I have throughout my career up till now. Thank you for your honesty there. I just uh, wrote a message uh, to Colby saying, does this sound interesting to you? You know, what the career 
he hasn't responded. <laughs> so or maybe you've you've scared him off from becoming a social psychologist. But no, I really appreciate your honesty and uh, and and, uh, and I know I can always trust you to be honest, which I love. Um, Thank you. Milk Milkman Dan said, "I think I'm an illusion sometimes." <laughs> <laughs> all right okay. well i want to know more about that does that feel good or bad yeah milkman dan does that feel good or bad and we'll see what they say um roman gelper and asks a, i think a very interesting question uh for roy what do you think about the internal costs in the form of negative emotions of shame and guilt of violating morality can they be worse than the social costs that's interesting okay um i did really get in for several years. I wrote a number of papers on guilt and surveyed the literature and uh, um, had a big psych bulletin review article and so on. Um, some to my surprise, guilt and shame are quite different uh, as, they're, as they're differentiated. And you know, my friend June Tangney has really been a, a pioneer mm -hmm. in these. Uh, the, the difference in, in her conceptualization is guilt is feeling bad that I did a bad Uh oh. Uh oh. Roy has frozen. Uh oh. Let's see. Oh, well, it appears Roy has has frozen on the screen here. I may have to call him on the phone. Roy, you're frozen. You're frozen, Roy. Oh. No problem. You want? Well, let me know what you think. Do you want to keep going, or do you want me to just tell everyone thanks, everyone? Uh, it's because we're coming up on the hour anyway. Okay. Okay. Then come back whenever you want and I'll stall until you just rejoin the link whenever you can. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell them a little bit about that. No problem. Okay. All right, everyone, he's coming back um, and we're going to talk about the, he just had to reboot his computer. Um, and here he is, he's coming back, the great Roy Baumeister. Dun, dun, dun. The eminent right. social psychologist Roy Baumeister is back. Are you back? I am back. I should say we're up in the mountains in Utah. And Wait, I don't hear you. I don't oh. hear you, Roy. Hold on. You hear me now? One, um, two, let me, three. Uh, I need to restart my headphones on. Okay. Um, I I should be I should be there. Um, Hold on, Roy. Okay. Just want to say apologies for the technical problem. I'm up in the mountains of Utah, and we're having a heavy snowstorm, which had subsided for the past hour. But uh, as I look out the window. It is back, and maybe that's causing some of the disruption. Can you hear me, Scott? Yes. So you can you hear me? Yes, I hear you just fine. All right. I was talking to the uh, the person's comment about uh, guilt and shame. So shame is I'm a bad person, and that's much harder to deal with. And and what I realized when I was reviewing the guilt literature, guilt has pretty positive effects on society. And I give talks on that. What I say is. You really don't want to have a business partner or a romantic partner uh, or a, a boss or whatever who, who has no sense of guilt. It gets back. I mean, those people are psychopaths. That's what we uh, talked about before. Um, guilt, guilt is really a, a force to make people behave effectively. 
um, uh, you know, feeling guilty, you know, guilt has a bad reputation because if you wallow and feel feeling guilty for a long time about something you can't do anything about anymore, well, that's unproductive. But in, in reality, what guilt mostly motivates people to do is to make it up to the other person. You know, when you feel guilty, you apologize, uh, you change your behavior, you realize what you did wrong. Uh, people often feel guilty about stuff that they didn't realize it was bad when they were doing it, but then they see afterwards and, and they say, sorry, and then they change their behavior and they don't do it again. So guilt is really a positive force uh, to enable people uh, to improve their behavior and to become better persons. And, and the thing is, guilt works best if you just learn what makes you feel guilty and then, and then avoid that. So uh, in a sense, in a, a well-functioning mind, you would hardly ever feel guilty, but you still have a sense of guilt that if I did that, and it's usually you're hurting somebody else. Guilt is, is much more interpersonal. We think of it as a solitary thing, but uh, I uh, have this paper with Harry Reese compared, you know, half a dozen negative emotions and guilt is much more interpersonal than the others. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's much more located in close relationships. I mean, you don't call your mother back, you feel guilty. You don't call your insurance agent back, you don't feel guilty. Uh, you know, and, and so, whereas- Well, I feel guilty if I don't call my mom back. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, so guilt is, is associated in close relationships That's and it regulates them and makes them uh, makes people behave better toward the people they they care about. Whereas, you know, fear is often strangers uh, related. Um, and uh, in our one of our samples, the most common thing people reported feeling guilty about was when they weren't paying enough attention to other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe this was when, when they make someone else feel guilty and, you know, you're ignoring me, you're neglecting me, you know. Say, oh, I call up my boyfriend and say, hey, I'm your girlfriend, remember me? Um, that's the <laughs> inducing guilt is to get people to pay more attention to others. And, and insofar as it works, it does, it does strengthen relationships. So uh, guilt, uh, as I said, somewhat to my surprise, this is not what I thought when I started uh, doing research on it. Uh, it's a very positive force. Now shame, uh, as, as Tangy says, is, is much more destructive. If you get the feeling I'm a bad person, well, what can you do about that? And so uh, people basically either withdraw uh, or they lash out, you know, both of which are interpersonally uh, destructive. And this is an important lesson, you know, for parents, if you're raising kids, yes, make them feel guilty when they do something wrong, help them understand that this is a bad thing to do, but they're still a good person. And that's, that's what's constructive about guilt. You're a fine person, you just did something wrong. And so apologize, make it up to them, and don't do that kind of thing again. Whereas shame, you know, you tell your kid you're a bad kid, you're worthless or whatever, that's setting them on a very destructive path. And again, there's no way to deal with being a bad person, but there is a way to deal with being a good person who did a bad thing. Yeah, great point. And, you know, it just makes me think about what we talked earlier about online shaming. We don't do online guilting. We do online shaming. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a bad person, you know, attack the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the people who actually do it, you know, feel guilty and they apologize and, and so on and try to uh, uh, try to make up for it. And so that, that can be constructive. Absolutely. Yeah, surrealist idealist uh, said, what differences in emotions like guilt or empathy exist around the world? Do we know much about any genetic and cultural dynamics that might contribute to these differences? Isn't there like a like East versus West distinction on... Public yes, there is, but I'm going to plead off on that one. I don't want to go outside my expertise and uh, cross-cultural differences in emotion stuff. I'm uh, I'm not yeah. really qualified to speak on. Well, I respect topic. that. What do you say? It's a it's a it's a good topic and so on yeah. and yeah. To study, but I just I respect that. Frank Martinez says, "My boss uses shame. What can I do?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you can educate your boss, but uh, you could show them the research evidence that says shame is destructive, guilt is uh, uh, is constructive, that uh, you have to get the people working for you to believe that they're good people and have a potential to do, uh, to do the right thing and, and to be good. Uh, uh, shame is, uh, is, is, is counterproductive. So tell your people, boss. 
Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have bad bosses. I, I, I know that. I remember, I think Bob Hogan was uh, citing data that uh, half the workers in America say the worst thing about their job is the boss, um, which is kind of shocking. Mm. Um, Roman Galperin says, my experience has been the opposite. Guilt causes people, rather than to make up for a misdeed, to, for the rest of their life, try to avoid the person it was done against, like after a bad breakup. So I guess just someone's personal experience. Well, I think what happens here, I mean, people do use guilt in relationships to manipulate the other person to do what they want them to do. But, and, and I, I suspect, I don't, I don't know data on this, but uh, you, you sort of try to build up uh, the other owing you by being guilty. And so you bring these things up. And at some point then the person will get away and say, you know, there's no future in this. I, uh, I can't go on in a relationship. So if you're trying to control your partner, inducing guilt is a very risky strategy. Yeah, I uh, can use it occasionally, but trying to manipulate that person into a permanent position of you're the guilty one, you owe me. And, and I, I have seen relationships where this, uh, this has happened um eventually walking away is the uh, the only thing uh that you do i know uh some relationships people don't want to apologize to the other they don't want to admit that the other is right and so on i think all these are destructive patterns and unfortunate to have relationships that don't don't get into that but i, I could see how, how easily that could happen and how costly it is so uh yeah you're right eventually you know too much guilt uh, and then the thing is just to uh, to go away. It's just no fun being in that relationship anymore. You know, Roy, you could your your second career could be a marriage counselor. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I always thought that would be an interesting uh, career because it's so interesting and intriguing. But I gather it's very depressing uh, mm -hmm. because. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're dealing with a lot of unhappy people and, and so few marriages by the time they get to that point uh, really recover. But yeah. I, don't know. I can imagine being a therapist in general it would can, can really, if you absorb their emotions, you know, it can be hard. Um, you know, Stacey S. had an interesting idea about the boss thing. Make the boss feel guilty <laughs> is what Stacey S. suggested. Uh, I thought that was clever. Uh, Manuel Manolo said, I can see guilt being evolutionary adva advanta advan advantageous, but not shame. Thoughts? And I guess you would agree that guilt could be evolutionary advantageous, right? Yeah, it may be that fear of shame uh, has uh, good effects, and especially in a small group as a way of controlling people or whatever. But uh, um, I don't know. I, I my. I'm inclined to agree with the uh, comment. Certainly guilt has a lot more positive uh, apparent effects than, than shame. You want to do one or two more? Or, uh, do we have anything yeah. more consciousness or free will or anything you want to talk about yet? Absolutely. You know, I think we, we might want to wrap up here because we're starting to get uh, maybe too personal. Frank Martinez says, I was given wrong phone number from girlfriend. I ignored her. I told her I received the message. Is that right? <laughs> I don't think you're, you can't, you can't discern what is more like you can't tell someone what is right and what is wrong universally, right? Yeah, I didn't quite understand the story, but uh, um... probably for the best. <laughs> probably for the best. Um, hey, look, I, I think I'll, I'll cut it off here. I just want to thank everyone for coming to, to join us and uh, bringing your questions to the table. And I want to thank Roy, man. This was a uh, hoot. I hope that you had some fun with this chat. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, too bad about the technical difficulties here and there, but uh, okay. like you said, this is a maiden voyage on this uh, this thing, and uh, um, we always have great conversations. Um, so glad to uh, uh, glad to do it, Scott, and um, keep up the good work, and um, look forward to the next time we can get to talk. Me too.